A real disciple will find a real master. A mediocre one will probably surrender to a mediocre master. A false disciple will be drawn to a false master. Nowadays, many people talk about fake masters. However, the fault belongs not just to the gurus, but mostly to the people who are attracted to those who tell them whatever they want to hear. Jai Prabhuji, hello everybody. We are at the seventh class of the course about the book Experimenting with the Truth. Today we are um, finishing the article that deals with the master-disciple relationship that we spread uh, over four lessons. And again, today is the last one. The words that we just read convey the point that there should be some correlation, Prabhuji tells us, between the qualities of the master to those of the disciples, of those who follow the masters. Prabhuji tells us a real disciple will follow a real master. A mediocre disciple will follow a mediocre master and a false one will be drawn to a false one. And that these days our focus tends to go to the master, to check, is the master enlightened? Is he qualified? Is he maybe false? And in general, our tendencies in life as egoic entities is usually to be focused on the other party and less on ourselves. And in my opinion, like in many other places of the yoga, of the retro progressive yoga, the, what is happening here is the attention is brought back to ourselves, which is what we always want to do as disciples and a spiritual experience. In every situation, in every experience that we have in life, if we are focusing on the other party, we might recognize a lot of qualities and maybe a lot of faults and a lot of even wisdom, even beauty. Whatever it may be, if we don't also observe ourselves, our experience, our choices, our understanding, our actions, this will, ne will never be a genuine spiritual development. We saw in the first class where we presented Prabhuji's words that he shares with us that everything that we receive in the retro progressive yoga is Prabhuji's own intimate journey, his contemplation, his focus is on himself. He observes. And in this, he invites us to do the same. Also in this and also explicitly, Prabhuji tells us, don't be occupied with me, but go to yourself, check yourselves, observe yourselves and discover your discoveries. Whatever they may be, they must be yours, genuine ones. And in here, I think that Prabhuji talks about both if we are spiritual experience or disciples and whatever experience we might have with the master, we want to check ourselves in this experience. If we follow an enlightened master, what in us pulled us to do it? What do we want in life? How was our experience? What in our actions and understanding and choices determine the outcome in whatever experience that we had? If we maybe follow a false guru, in my opinion, the retro progressive yoga does not condemn it because it does not condemn anything. But it invites us to check, not in order to find the guilty ones, but in order to bring more clarity. We understand as spiritual aspirants that what uh, prevents us from being in touch with reality is our own lies, our own projections, our own um, distorted reality that is a result of our fears and our desires and all our conditioning. Because of our conditioning, we project on life specific patterns and we do not see 
things as they are. We will deal with it more when we uh, enter into the chapter that deals with the mind. And therefore, in order to gain clarity, what we want is to observe these patterns, to observe our choices, our understanding, our actions, and not to expect to find only that we are beautiful, that we are right, that we are smart, which this is our tendency as egos. But to check where maybe we didn't do the perfect action. We weren't truly honest, etc. So I think that Prabhuji uh, always welcomes us to an honest intellectual examination. Also, if we follow this phenomenon, Externally, we analyze, we cannot only focus on the master. We want to see the entire phenomenon and the individuals who follow this master. And as we said, there must be some correlation. If someone decides to study medicine, his qualities, his aspirations in his life, his characteristics are related to the object that he decides to follow, to adapt, to surrender to. And this is true for any other example that we will take. There is some correlation, not just between us and the master, but also between our experience and the master. We spoke about it in previous classes. When we come in touch with knowledge, we cannot look at the knowledge uh, as an object that is determined and that we are going to receive it in a specific exact way, regardless of our interaction with it. In other words, the way we approach this object, knowledge, master, a book, a lecture, a movie, whatever it may be, our receptivity, our inquiry, the process that we go through, the attitude in which we are situated will determine the outcome, the experience. So in this also Prabhupada tells us we shouldn't just focus on the master and how enlightened it is, but we should also take into account the other party because this is a complete experience and we want to analyze it completely, fully, in order to gain as much wisdom and understanding and clarity that we can, which this is our aspiration, a spiritual aspirant. We want to um, examine carefully and get rid of all the projection that can prevent us from coming in touch with the things as they are. The disciple must have an attitude of service and exploration. If we approach a guru, it should be in order to serve and not to be served, to give and not to receive. The guru cannot give you anything that you do not already have. You only need the self, but you already are the self. Hence, only you can give it to yourself. The Guru teaches you the art of giving, so you can give the Self to yourself. Here Prabhuji talks to us about the aspect of giving in the master-disciple relationship. We, in this relationship, we see giving that the disciple gives the master. And Prabhuji here sheds light on this phenomenon. As we said, when we uh, we have a specific concrete seeing of reality and we have a specific interpretation when we examine the reality with dualistic eyes. We spoke about it in the previous class. But we understand that in the spiritual realm, all the interpretation changes because the foundation of the understanding and of the desires of the disciple and of the master are fundamentally different. So here Prabhuji takes us into a journey which will start from a giving that we read in this paragraph, but will continue and take us uh, into this relationship and we will see how from the giving, concrete giving, that soon we will speak about, we will explain it. Prabhuji leads us into the understanding of the uh, building blocks in this relationship, which are love, which are unity, which are trust, into the surrender, which is our aspiration, as disciples in this relationship, that the surrender will happen. And from the surrender into the seeing, which is our original desire. If you remember, we spoke about it in the previous class. The disciple approaches an individual that he recognizes as someone who is situated in the transcendent, in clear seeing of reality, because he wants to see himself, he or she, of course, always. 
So finally, the aspiration is not even the surrender, but the seeing, the clarity. And in this article, it's the end of the article, in this part of the article, Prabhuji leads us through these stages. So now we are at the stage of the giving, and Prabhuji explains to us about this giving. Usually, when we look again with dualistic eyes, the aspect of giving is extremely significant. Because as egoic entities, we spoke about the point that we want to live, we want to survive, we want to enrich ourselves, we want to chase happiness and success and achievement and to escape any danger, any fear, anything that can diminish us. This is why taking is very significant and this is why giving threatens us as egoic entities. We, of course, like to give to some extent. I'm sure everyone can recognize this. And this is also because our true nature is giving. So yes, we enjoy to give. But we, if we examine carefully and honestly, we will see that even if we give, it is very measured. It is very calculated. And it is in the condition that ultimately we are going to receive from the situation. As a goic entity, we will be benefited, not harmed, not diminished. We are afraid to give, in other words. And what Prabhuji tells us here is that in this relationship, we come to learn the art of giving. The disciple understands that our current state, that we are not in giving, we are in taking. So every situation in life that we will approach, we can easily recognize if we read a book or if we watch a movie or if we enter into a relationship or if we go to a party or whatever situation we enter into studying the university, we are looking in it with the eyes of what am I going to take from it? What will be my benefit? We're not entering into situations so the other party will benefit from us. Even when we do it, for example, philanthropic activities or we help someone, which of course we all do, we want to become, to come out of it ultimately, again, peaceful, happy, benefited, etc. And the disciple understands that this fear of giving is what doesn't allow us to surrender, to open. If we think about it, the disciple is someone who wants not just to give a specific item to a specific individual, but he wants to surrender to life. He wants to surrender to God. He wants to transcend himself, all his desires, all together. So, he must learn this art of giving. And this is what Prabhuji tells us that happens in this relationship. The external giving that we see is very, uh, it's what we say the tip of the iceberg. This is just a superficial happening. But what happens in the depths is that both the disciple and the master entering into a process where they want to lead the disciple into the transcendence, into the relaxation, into the openness that will be enabled once we exercise this giving, that we exercise in this relationship. We learn to give. What also Prabhuji tells us here is that ultimately, also the master does not give us. We can say the master gives us wisdom, the master gives us peace. The master helps us on the path. He gives us guidance. But would you say, no, the master doesn't give you anything. Because what we want, in fact, is not an object. And it's not something that we are lacking. The, as we said again, the superficial giving that someone gives something to someone is not related to really what happens in this relationship. Because the object, quote unquote, that we seek is not an object and is not missing. Prabhuji says, what we want is the self, and we have the self already. We just don't recognize it because of this very attitude of being contracted, of not relaxing, of not opening. 
Prabhuji tells us, because we don't know to give, we don't give the self to ourselves. So what the master does, he does not give us anything, but he teaches us an attitude in which we will maybe one day be able to transform and give the self to ourselves. So no party gives anything to the other party in the depths. Both parties, the disciple and the master, are interested in some occurrence that we will get to further in this article. Prabhuji will lead us to there, to the surrender, to the love, to the unity. The giving is, a, again, an action that helps us to cultivate the attitude in us, that helps us to transform ourselves. But it, this is not the important thing that is happening. Disciples do not approach a spiritual master when they need knowledge, but when they are wary of information and their hearts have turned into big question marks. They put aside everything they know and become receptive. They ask, examine and explore, but not through intellectual questioning. The spiritual learning process is not just intellectual, but also transcendental. It is an unconditional encounter where the disciple, thirsty for truth, asks for nothing. The master, on the other hand, does not promise paradise after death. Disciples do not demand anything because they do not know what they seek. Masters do not promise anything because what they offer is already part of their silence and presence. So here Prabhuji tells us that when we approach the spiritual master. When an individual decides to be a disciple, is at a point in his life or her life when he is already tired of information, of methods, of tries and errors, of ideas, and he's coming open to listen to some other sort of wisdom, to some other route. He understands that he satisfied all other alternatives. And his goal is still not fulfilled. And now he shifts his focus into a different type of route in life, where he or she are no longer the controller of what is going on. Now they want this individual he wants or she wants to listen to an individual that they recognize as a source of valid knowledge that can guide them. As we spoke in the previous class, we trust this individual. We verify that this is a qualified teacher before we embark on the journey. And now we attempt to listen and to surrender. We are tired of information. So in other words, we are not seeking more words, more methods, more ideas, more techniques. But we want to listen to the master himself or herself, to their presence. Prabhuji tells us something interesting here that I would like us to pay attention, even though it's uh, mentioned just briefly, and Prabhuji continues with the context, but I would like to pose a little bit on it. Prabhuji tells us the spiritual learning process is not just intellectual, but also transcendental. So this dragged my attention. And what I think is significant here, that Prabhuji, uh, what he talks about here is, of course, that this, our desire is not some intellectual enrichment, but transformation. We want to transcend our experience altogether, our seeing in life, as we said. However, Prabhuji doesn't say it is not intellectual, but it says it's, he says it's not just intellectual. So what I think the significance of it here is that the spiritual process is not, not intellectual. In other words, it is also intellectual. In other words, the aspect of thinking, of understanding, of contemplation is of utmost significance. Last class we spoke about the point that the 
Masters do not fulfill disciples' expectations, and we saw how in extreme cases disciples can forget and even, God forbid, go against their masters. And what is lacking in this moment of forgetfulness when we forget, or what can help us in the moment that we forget, is exactly the intellectual clarity, the understanding. Why are we on this path? What do we want? Why did we enter? What did we want originally? Where are we heading when we forget, when our mind is turbulent and uh, we have egoic reactions and we feel resistance and the path is difficult for us? What can help us to maintain is the intellectual clarity. This is why we can find the intellectual aspect elaborated and significant in many paths. It's very important in many spiritual paths, of course, we refer to spiritual paths here. Not because we care to enrich our intellect. Not because we want to be sophisticated intellectually or to gain now intellectual uh, qualification that we didn't have before and again enrich our ego. But because the understanding is so important and in a way when we deal with study, when we read, when we listen, we also hope to go through transformation, through openness, through receptivity. But we also don't dismiss the intellectual understanding and this is why we want to understand and explain and shed clarity on the topics. But here Prabhuji does not talk about the intellectual aspect. He speaks about the transformation that is happening, that the disciple doesn't seek intellectual enrichment. And he mentions that the spiritual process is also intellectual, but it's not just intellectual. So this is a side note about the intellectual aspect. We will get to it more in future classes. But the main point that is conveyed here is that when the disciple enters into this relationship, he is open to listen. He wants an experience. He wants to, again, transform himself or herself through this dialogue with the master. So the disciple is coming tired of information, open, receptive. And in a way, the disciple is very, because of this, because he's tired of so many other trials, he's coming very proactive, very determined. As we spoke about the Buddha as an example of the spiritual aspirant, he left everything behind with a determination to discover something substantial, something more ultimate than everything that the eye can see. The disciple is someone who is determined. He knows where he's heading. He does not know what he seeks, but he knows where he's heading. And he is active in that sense. At the same time, or simultaneously, or because of it, as a consequence, out of being active and out of the understanding that all the other methods did not, lead, did not lead him to the desired results, he understand that in this route in life, and this type of relationship, in this type of dialogue and encounter, he is now going to be totally passive. He is going to be receptive so the wisdom of the master can flow into him, so he can listen to what the master conveys to him. So in a way, the disciple is not busy with giving, but in some sense, he is busy with getting, with receiving, with being infected, with getting what the master can embark on him. In superficial eyes, we can think that this disciple is someone who, is, who has a weak character, who does what someone else advises him, who listens to other individuals' words, who follows another individual's experience. But just the opposite is right, and if we examine it carefully, it will be easy for us to get to this conclusion. Because the disciple is someone with such a strong character, like in the case of the Buddha, that left everything behind against all the noise of the world, against all the noise of his or her own mind, and follow this conviction this intimate experience that you spoke about that happened to us when we touch something of the beyond oftentimes if we are lucky it will happen to us with the presence of a realized being 
together with the intellectual understanding and the understanding of the fact that currently we are not in touch with reality. We are in some sort of illusion. And the desire to penetrate through this illusion is so strong in him, is so powerful, that he is going against all odds in this impossible journey. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their course and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Matthew 16, 24, 25, New Testament. Here we see how radical, how dramatic is this shift in our life. How intensive must be this path that we deny ourselves. And Jesus tells us we will gain ourselves by denying ourselves. And this is a desire of a disciple. This is why we embark on this journey. This is why we enter into this relationship. The master is masculine even when expert through a female guru. Similarly, even male disciples adapt a female attitude. They approach the master with vulnerability and receptivity. Their attitude is passive and unguarded. The surrender of every soul in love is feminine in nature. Its openness allows it to be penetrated by the presence of the master. The cultivation of receptivity and vulnerability prepares us for unconditional surrender, which is an essential step toward total transformation. Surrender comes from the disciple's heart and is never imposed by the master. If it is forced, one should question the veracity of such a goal. So we continue, as we said, with this process where Prabhuji, where Prabhuji walks us through. We spoke about the gross giving and the meaning of it in actuality. And now Prabhuji talks about the importance of the receptivity. The fact that the disciple is necessarily the feminine party in this relationship. And the master is necessarily the masculine party in this specific relationship, in this dialogue. Because the disciple is interested to receive what the master can give him. The disciple is coming with an attitude of service and inquiry, as we saw in Bhagavad Gita 434, Learn the truth only by approaching a spiritual master, inquiring from him submissively and serving him. The self-realized soul can impart wisdom to you because he has seen the truth. So here we see the feminine attitude, the feminine position. We said previously the disciple is wary of information, is uh, satisfied all other routes in life, and now he's coming to listen and to receive. For that he must become feminine. He must allow the master to penetrate into him, the wisdom to penetrate into him. He needs to serve. He needs to inquire. This is why also he needs to be the one who gives to the master. He's opening up to the master. And the master leads him. The master guides him. The master protects him. This is why the master is masculine in this relationship. The master is the responsible. The master is the one who sees. The master in front of the universe, in front of the divine, in front of life, is definitely not masculine, but he's expert in being feminine. He's totally in acceptance. He is not approaching life with an attitude of someone who knows, but he is a disciple. He is listening. And because he's so much feminine in his nature, in this relationship with the disciple, he is the one that needs to be the masculine because he can help the disciple to become feminine as well. He can guide him into this femininity, into the receptivity, into the openness that both the master and the disciple desire that will occur in the heart of the disciple. So we said from the giving, we're going towards the surrender. So here Prabhuji talks about this quality of the receptivity of the openness and we will continue forward in this article into the surrender. So let's continue.
Unconditional surrender is the path to a deep communion between disciple and master. Whoever has not yet found a master can surrender to life, existence, or totality. The important thing is awakening unconditional surrender in one's heart. The disciple does not surrender to someone, but to divinity. Not to a person, but at the feet of truth. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva dharman pariti adjya, ma mekam sharanam vraja, aham tuam sarva papevyo, mokshe ishyami, ma shuchaha. Abandon all varieties of dharma and simply surrender unto me alone. I shall liberate you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. Bhagavad Gita 18.66 So here we get into this surrender. This is the heart of this relationship. This is the aspiration in this relationship that this surrender will happen in the heart of the disciple. The surrender is not something that can be done. We cannot decide to be surrendered and the day after we will be surrendered. We need to go through this process of giving, of listening, of transformation, of exercising, of learning this art of giving. And we hope that the surrender will occur. Because the surrender is not a mechanic action that we can do it. It's not out of intellectual understanding. It's not out of mental conception. Intellectually, we might have understood that we want to surrender. We might have understood that this is the path to freedom, to happiness, to relaxation, to acceptance. We want this surrender. Nevertheless, we are still not able to surrender as egoic entities. And we are going through this transformation, which is the master-disciple relationship, which is what happens in this dialogue with the master. But the aspiration is that the surrender will happen. This is why we give maybe time, maybe object, maybe listening. But what we want is that the surrender will happen. Finally, naturally, as an organic phenomenon and not like something mechanic that will happen. What Prabhuji tells us here is that the surrender, once it happens, it's no longer to an individual. We don't really surrender to the master, Prabhuji tells us. When the surrender happens, we go out of this dialogue, out of the dual plane, and we surrender to everything. We surrender to the divine, we surrender to life, we surrender to God. Once this surrender is happening, and this is where the master leads us. He is not interested that we will surrender to him as an individual. He is not in need of our surrender. But he helps us to cultivate the ground so the surrender can happen in us and we can open to life. And now we will continue with the article and we'll see where we're heading forward with this surrender. And we will read a, a verse of Shankaracharya that speaks about this phenomenon of surrender. Surrendering to the wise, to a wise personality, to someone who is situated already in full surrender, in transcendence, in seeing of the reality. And Shankara tells us how precious it is and how rare it is that it can only happen to us thanks to divine grace. So let's read Shankara's words. This is from the Viveka Chudamani, number three. And Shankara tells us, Dur labam trayam evaitat daiva nugraha hetukam. Manushyatvam mumukshutvam maha purusha samshrayaha. Unusual and difficult to obtain are these three a human birth, an ardent desire for liberation, and the capacity to completely surrender to a sage. These three are really rare, and wherever they are found, it must be understood that they are the result of divine grace. The evolutionary process that takes place within the master-disciple relationship flourishes from trust, love, and loyalty. The development of the disciple is not the result of a specific activity. The aspirant does not evolve due to a particular practice. Every practice is a preparation, but it does not lead to development itself. So as we said, here Prabhuji talks to us, or maybe he summarizes in a way the point of the surrender, that what allows this surrender is not an action that we do, it's not some understanding that we gain, 
but it's an organic process that will happen out of love, out of loyalty, out of trust. So in the dialogue with the master, this is what we want to cultivate. This is why we give. This is why we listen. This is why we love. This is why we uh, try to unite with the master. We are interested in this transformation within our heart and not in any external occurrence that will happen. The cultivation of the love and the loyalty and the trust can allow the surrender to happen. And now we are continuing forward with our process, with the process that happens within the master-disciple relationship. True masters shine but never dazzle. Authentic disciples are on a quest to dissipate darkness. They long to see clearly what is as it really is. Human beings do not perceive the world as it is, but as it appears to them. Instead of observing, they project their mental structures on what they see. Disciples realize this and see clarity. The master does not give them anything specific, but only the chance to see what already is. The Guru is light and offers clarity to the disciple who lives in the dark. I was born in the darkest ignorance and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. Shri Guru Gita 34 so here is promise we are closing we can say the circle that we started in the previous class when we spoke about the foundation that the disciple enters into this relationship with the understanding that he does not see reality as it is with the desire to penetrate through the illusion with the understanding that his egoic perspective in life is a going point of view and ev on everything on everything that happens on every situation, on himself, does not allow him to see life directly. And he wants to open his eyes. This is why he connects with this individual and seeks guidance and wants to follow him. We see here that in the end of this relationship, the culmination after the giving and the receptivity and the femininity and the love and the trust, and hopefully the surrender will occur, where it will take us ultimately is again to a realm that is not inside this relationship, but is transcendental to any dualistic relationship, into direct seeing of reality. This is where the Guru promises how, us that he uh, that awaits for us in the other side of this dialogue. This is what our aspiration is, and this is where we are heading to, and we will ultimately get if we follow this relationship with all our heart and with all our mind, with totality. This is where this dialogue takes us, to seeing the reality directly, through and thanks to the help of this individual, of the Master. The disciple and the Master are both searching. Disciples seek to open up to unlimited receiving, so that the wide and unconditional opening allows them to accept the entire universe. The master, on the other hand, seeks an appropriate recipient for the infinite secret. At a superficial glance, it would seem that the disciple gives everything to the Guru in exchange for spiritual elevation. Yet, the encounter between the two is not a give-and-take relationship. The real intention is to awaken the dormant divine potential that lies in the disciple. So here, beautifully and interestingly, Prabhuji tells us, in fact, not only the disciple searches, not only the disciple is a seeker, the master is also seeking something. Both the master and the disciple seeking this occurrence, which is the transformation that happens in the disciple. And I was trying to contemplate about this point to understand the position of the master that we cannot fully understand because we are not in his seeing, we are not in his uh, establishment in the truth. But what I could gather is that we can imagine that the master is someone who recognizes this secret, as he calls it here, that we all seek, 
that we all want, that we all speak about, and that we attempt to discover in so many ways, not only spiritual experience, but every human being, we want freedom. We want happiness. We want to transcend our misery without a doubt. And we're trying in so many ways. And the master is someone who realizes this secret because he was once in our position, but he discovered, like we spoke about the Buddha, he managed to fulfill his thought that there is a substantial happiness transcendentally to the happiness and suffering in the dualistic plan. And he sees us individuals seeking for it and yet not opening to it and yet not listening to it. The master is seeking for an individual, in my opinion, and understanding from Prabhuji's words, not that we'll admire him, not that we'll read his books, not that we'll join the ashram, but that we'll really listen to this secret, that we really will open up to this abundance that the Guru can give us, but we refuse to receive, we refuse to listen to and to open to. He seeks this recipient. And all this dialogue, all this relationship between the disciple and the master is the preparation for this occurrence because both the master and the disciple are seeking this occurrence. That once it's happened, it's no longer individual. This is a, a happening that is in a, in a level of the universe. This is something that is transcendental to our existence as entities because it's so significant once an individual transcends the egoic identification. So Prabhuji tells us both are seeking. And again, he strengthens this point that he says on a superficial level, it seems that someone gives to someone else, that there are two parties. But in this uh, terminology, who gives to who, as we spoke before, who is getting, who is giving, the disciple gives something to the master, he gives object, he gives time, he gives listening, the master gives to him wisdom, and he gives to him bliss, and he gives to him shakti maybe. This is superficial. This is on the dualistic plane. Prabhuji tells us ultimately there is no giver and taker. This is not a give and take relationship because the master and the disciple are together. They have the same goal. These are not two separated parties and for sure not opposite parties. But there is a complete unity between the master and the disciple, even though they are so distant, even though they are in completely different level of consciousness. Both of them are going together toward the same aspiration. So they are united. So there is no question of who gives to who and who gets from who, because the goal is united because the aspiration is one. This is why the master and the disciple are one. Prabhuji told, that, told us in this article, this is a duet of one. They are totally together on this path. The Sri Guru Gita says, Yajnavra tam tapodanam japas tir tam tathaivacha Guru tatuam avidnaya mudhaste charate janaha the practice of japa, the rituals of sacrifice, vows, penance, charity, and pilgrimages are all a waste of time without a proper understanding of the Guru principle. Sri Guru Gita 24. Prabhuji tells us here, if we are in front of a Guru, if we have the grace to associate with a Guru, and we are occupied with the japa, with the meditation, with our goals, with our understanding, with our advancement, without understanding the Guru principle, we are wasting our time. The Guru is someone who is personifying the truth that we desire. In other words, we have direct contact with the object of our desires, which is the transcendental, which is truth. We have a, com a, a constant dialogue with the truth. If we dismiss this point, the Guru principle, the understanding of the a tremendous treasure that we have in our hands, and we are focused on our sadhana, not as a help to receive from the, this grace, but regardless of this grace, we are missing the point. Because we are 
practicing for something that will happen tomorrow and we're not paying attention to the truth that is currently in front of our eyes. Prabhuji, just yesterday we had a darshan with Prabhuji um, outside the ashram, we were sitting in the evening and Prabhuji spoke about this point that how important is the Guru principle and he spoke about the point that it's like uh, the situation of getting married and he's paying attention to the tuxedo, to the food, to the guests, but he forgets the bride. So this happened just yesterday and it was exactly about this point, about the significance of the presence of an authentic individual that experienced truth in our life. And as experience, we can dismiss this it's in front of our eyes and be occupied with other routes to get to the truth that as we spoke in the previous class, any other route without the help of a genuine master is going to be so much longer and more difficult and less likely that it will bring us results than the association with a genuine master. So if we un misunderstand this principle, we are missing the point. All disciples desire to be close to their master. But despite living very near physically, they never manage to feel close to someone. The distance they feel is the distance from themselves. The phenomenon of the master is more a presence than a substance, a simultaneous presence, an absence of someone or something objectivized in space and time, and lacks the apparent mass and substantiality of the limited egoic phenomenon. The guru is an embodied void, the shadow of the nothingness, a reflection of emptiness on the lack of relativity. By trying to get closer to where the Guru is, we will discover where we actually are. In the presence of the Master, disciples recognize themselves. In fact, this is the idea behind the word satsang, which means to sit with the truth. Satsang is the deep and intimate communion of two presences, two silence, emerging as one. What happens between them is a love story, but it is unlike any romance we know. It is not a relationship between two, but a duet of one. And here Prabhuji explains to us why it is so significant to understand the Guru principle. Why it is so precious to associate with a genuine realized master. What is so special in this personality? How it can help us? Prabhuji explains to us that the master is someone who emptied himself. He is still on the realm of the dual world. Of course, we see the Guru, we speak to him, he has a body, he has a name, he has a form, he has characteristics. He speaks to us, he interacts with us. Yet, because he is someone who transcended the egoic perspective, he embodied in his own personality, in his words, in his actions, the void, the transcendence. And through the interaction with him, we ourselves can get in touch with this void. This is why, as we spoke previously, when we meet the Guru, we feel that we meet ourselves. We feel that we arrived home. We are in touch with this, with the truth, with the beauty of the truth, directly. Thanks to this individual who did the work that we are now attempting to do. The Guru already walked through this path. He once was an ego. He once was identified. But he uh, managed again to penetrate through the illusion as we saw in the case of the Buddha. And to situate himself in transcendental seeing. So even though he is still an entity in the world and Thankfully, this is the case because because of it, we can interact with this void. Thanks to the fact that, it's, that it happens in a personality, in a person. But because of this grace, because of the work that he did, we are receiving the grace by the association with him. And this is why we hear in Hinduism as the Guru Kripa the grace of being with the Guru, the grace of receiving guidance of the Guru. It is a grace because it's not ours. It's not our work. 
It's not thanks to our efforts to transcend the egoic phenomenon, but it thanks to the work that this individual did with himself or herself. We are uh, coming in touch with the divine. And this grace guides us. And this grace encourages us to make the effort ourselves. So hopefully one day we will be able to situate ourselves in it. Prabhuji tells us that in this uh, association with the Guru, we will never meet somebody because it's a void. So we are attracted, but it's never set aside. We spoke about this point in the previous classes when we spoke about the attachment to the Guru, is that when we are coming in touch with this absence, we are pulled into it, but it's never going to be satisfied. But it's going to push us to advance on this path, to desire our transformation. And this is the grace of the Guru. And in addition, it's a dialogue that we constantly have with the reality, we can say. Every association with the Guru is exactly what we need for our development. The Guru sees us. The Guru sees the egoic identification and he sees our potential. And he sees where we are erring, where we are confused, when we are making mistakes. And he can guide us because of this seeing, thanks to this seeing. So this is an immense grace. Let's read the words of Shola Vishvanata Chakravarti Takua in the Guru Ashtaka about this immense grace. Yasya Prasadat Bhagavat Prasado, Yasya Prasada Nagati Kutopi, Dayan Stuvan Sasya Yashastra Sandyam, Van de Guru Shri Charanara Vindam. This is Guru Ashtaka 8. It is by the compassion of the spiritual master that one is able to receive the divine blessing of God. Without Guru's grace, there is no possibility to advance spiritually. Therefore, we must remember and constantly glorify the spiritual master. At least three times daily, we should offer our most respectful reverences to the lotus feet of the Guru. As we contemplate the beautiful piece of art, we might feel embraced by tender peace and refreshing happiness. However, if we analyze the components of the painting in a laboratory, we will not find peace. Happiness does not come from a picture, but from our inner depths. In other words, a colorful canvas connects us to the source of bliss which always resides within our intimate depths. Similarly, what we experience in the presence of the Master is our true nature, or God. So here Prabhuji compares this experience that we experience in the presence of a genuine Master, someone who really realizes himself, to the experience that we touch in art, which is something that we can all easily connect with. This is an example that I remember from the very first days that Prabhuji used to give us. When we see a beautiful painting and we feel joy and beauty and peace, this experience is not in the object. Because if we take the painting, there is no happiness there. We can disassemble it, we can break it down, we will not find joy, we will not find freedom. All these experiences that we can feel when reading a book, when watching a movie, when um, reading a poem, when looking at a painting, coming from our own depths, Prabhuji tells us. And this is similar to what happens with the Master. The bliss that we feel cannot be in a different individual because we feel it. We experience it. The feeling that we arrive at home it's not in the Guru. He has his experience, her experience. But what we experience, what we touch, is ours. And it can be evoked in the right situation, when the right conditions allow it. In the spiritual path, in the master-disciple relationship, we are pulled to pave our path toward this experience that we touched. Because we understand it's in us. We experience that this is in us. And this is why we follow the individual in this relationship out of our most intimate call. This is a relationship between us and the divine, not a different individual. This is what happens on, a, on the dualistic plane. But 
essentially, this is a relationship between us and life, between us and ourselves. And this is our aspiration. The guru is such a loving individual, such a caring individual, that he helps us to get into this experience that he's situated in, that he's established in, and that in this experience, we are no longer in the interaction between individuals, between entities, but we are situated transcendentally to it. And for the last word in this article, I think that it will be appropriate that we will try to practice everything that we gain in this article. In the last four classes, we absorbed a lot of aspects and elements, and hopefully we have a good understanding of the nature of this relationship, of the aspiration in this relationship, and the transformation that we aspire to as spiritual aspirants in the spiritual plane, what we actually want which as we understand, it's the listening itself, is the receptivity itself. So we can get in touch with something that is transcendental to intellectual understanding, transcendental to actions, transcendental to appearances in this world, but that it's the most intimate experience that happens between us and ourselves. So let's listen to Prabhuji's words, attempting to develop this um, attitude that he guides us into in this article, and in this we will conclude this class and the study of this article that explains the master-disciple relationship. Jai Prabhuji. The disciple is a potentiality and the master a manifestation. The former is a seed, the latter a tree. The guru represents the possibilities of the disciple. The disciple represents what the Guru once was. The Master is the disciple's future. The disciple is the Master's past. In front of the Master, disciples are faced with the possibilities that existence dreams for them. The spiritual Master is the most faithful expression of the Absolute within the relative. The Self expresses itself in the Master's silence, glances and gestures. Before the Master, we feel less like a mind or body and more like a being. This presence emanates from the totality of someone who is established in the here and now. To learn from Masters, we need to sit close to them and listen to the melody flowing from their soul. In tune with their silence, we will recognize our own peace in the depths of the soul. <laughs>